again. Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in on it out on the lake. When all the people were along the shore at the water's edge, he taught them many things by parables. And his teaching said, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did. Some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell along ro rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell along the thorns, which grew up and choked the plant, some that, some that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 times. Then Jesus said, he who has, hear, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? <coughs> the farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path. When the word is sown, as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown to them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word at once, receive it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. Then trouble or persecution comes because of the word. They quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among the thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and desires for other things come in and choke the word, make it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Thirty, sixty, or even a hundred times that was sown. All right, um, now we're going to go from 35 to 41. Jesus calms a storm. That day, when everything came, he said to the disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. Then were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. Disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? When even the wind and the waves obey him. That's the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. get a kick out of that. I really do. Um, it's beautiful. It's rewarding. It's uh, there's so many teachings in, in, in that passage. So many. And I I'm just in awe when he says, you know what, you know, like, well, where is your faith? Where is your faith in all of this? So, 
over a year ago, I had gotten a text, and uh, I think everybody knows what a text is now. And it's like uh, one of these mass texts, and I'm really into texting people and saying, hey, how you doing, thinking about you, whatever. And so my cousin, she sends me this text from Philadelphia, and it was about this passage. And she says, well, what kind of seed are you? to think about that because there were so many in there you know so I really I, you know I didn't want to give a quick answer so I just thought about it but this brings me back to when I was a young girl when I was a little girl and back in Philadelphia and I did everything really fast I mean I was a fast kid I was the fastest kid in the neighborhood and so I used to race against, you know, we used to have these little racing contests and everything. And I didn't want to race against the girls because I knew I would beat them. They were not fast enough. So I always wanted to race against all the boys, you know. And then say, aha, gotcha. Eat my dust, you know. <laughs> and that was fun doing that, you know. But um, one day we were in the, in the <laughs> playground. And this guy comes up and he says, well, hey, who wants to go and race against these other kids on the other side of the city? And I was the first one. I'm like, me? I want to go. So they put us all on the bus and we go out. And it was fun for me, you know. And I remember getting off the bus and I didn't know anything about track and field or anything like that. And they just said, on your mark, set, go. I just took off. And I'm like, where's everybody at? You know? But there was a guy there who was actually clocking us. And clocking means timing, you know, timing you as you run. And uh, I did not know that this guy was doing this. I did not know that there was actual coaches there looking for people to run on real professional track teams. And I was just, I was a little girl. And Philadelphia is the fifth largest city in America. And trying to find one little girl in a city that big is like trying to find, you know, that needle in the haystack type of thing. But he found me. He actually found me. He knocked on my grandmother's door, because I was raised by my grandparents. He knocked on the door, and my grandmother calls me out, and she says, oh, well, would you like to be on this track team? And I said, yeah, sure, because it was all fun to me. And next thing I know, I'm on this track team, and like I said, it was all fun for me, but they, the other girls on the team, it was, you know, it was a real big deal for them. And I was, you know, eating ice cream and drinking sodas, and it's like, okay, it's time. For, you're up, Cynthia. Well, they called me Cindy, you know. They're like, it's, you're up, Cindy. And I'm like, okay. And I remember running, and then at the end, I would throw up. <laughs> because I didn't know that it was not good to eat ice cream and cake and all this other stuff <laughs> before you ran a race, you know. But I traveled all around the country. California, Boston, um, to just about um, every major city, you know, in America, and it was just fun. And I started changing because I started, my outlook on life started changing because I started thinking like, okay, I could be in the Olympics. I was that fast at a very young age that I could be part of the Olympic team. And if you've um, been reading in the news, I think there's um, this one kid, uh, I think he's about 14 or something. Where, well, he's the youngest ever that's going to be in this Olympics um, category or whatever. But that could have been me. And so my eyes was on that. That's where my focus was, that I'm going to be on this Olympic team and I'm going to be a corporate lawyer. 
But that's what I wanted. That's where my focus was. And um, then I later on, I wanted to be a candy striper. <laughs> and my grandmother, she was a nurse. And I told my, my aunts, and one of them, she's here. I said, I want to be a candy striper. And she, they all laughed at me. And I'm sitting there like, why are you laughing at me? You know, what you say that, Hope? They don't know what a candy striper <laughs> no, is. But Hope's like, what are you talking about? I'm looking at her face, Marcia. She's like, what are you talking about? And uh, a candy striper is, you know, somebody that did, like, uh, help people in uh, uh, hospitals and things like that, you know, where they get them water and help them with all kinds of things, you know. They're like little helpers. And uh, they laughed at me, and they said, mm, no, Cindy, that's not for you. And I said, well, why? And they said, honey, you just don't have any patience. You don't have the patience to do that kind of work. And all the stuff that goes along with it, mm -mm. think of something else to do. You know, because I wanted a summer job. I wanted to make money. But Candy Striper was out. So I said, okay, well, maybe they know more than I do. So I let that go. But then as I got older, I, re I kind of realized that that was like a true statement, that I had like no patience. They have patience for people, things, and whatever. I was like, go, go, go. If you're not ready, I'm gone. You know, you know, let's go. And uh, and then I got pregnant, and I had my first son, Sean, and he's here. And um, it was a normal pregnancy and everything else. He had an Avgar score of ten, and you know everything was good. And then I started noticing that something wasn't quite right. Um, like the developmenting things that, you know, you're reading all those little parenting magazines. I'm like, mm -hmm. well, that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I think they're wrong. I don't think they know what they're talking about. But, <laughs> you know, but like my loving family, they said, oh, you know, he's fine. He'll do whatever he needs to do when he gets ready. And But I didn't have any patience to wait for him to get ready. I'm like, come on, talk now. Walk. Do something, you know. But then he, later on, he was diagnosed um, with a speech impairment, um, a hearing disability, and he was also diagnosed with having ADHD. You know, not ADD, ADHD. And now that's, that's no patience right there. And I remember running around chasing him all over and I'm like, what? You know, I can't take this. And I'm crying on the phone and I'm calling my, my relatives like, what do I do? I can't do this, you know? And they're like, well, did you check him? Did you change him? Did you burp him? Did you feed him? Yeah, I did all that stuff, but he won't stop crying. Well, why won't you stop crying? What are you crying for? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why. But see, God has a way of shaping and molding us to what He wants us to be. So where I thought, where I thought that I had no patience, where they told me that I had no patience to be a candy striper or anything else, I later find out that God gave me an angel who taught me how to learn to be patient. There's an art to it, I think. Especially when you're in the presence of the Lord's, his type of patience, that level of patience. Sean also taught me how to be still within the Lord also. Because I was thinking, you know, why? Why, why my kid? Why is this happening to me? And being able to 
to stop and try to understand him, to be still, and see the beauty of what God gave me. You know, that's not all of them too. And I can see the shaping and the molding, learning how to be patient. I ask myself, what seed am I? I say this all because I can see. I can see when you are so grounded, more grounded in his love and his word and his truth, patience and being still and being focused, it seems to come naturally with the territory. It's part of the package, so to speak, you know. And I came here, we came here to Calvary back in uh, 2004. We came here, started coming here to Calvary off and on. And, you know, I was trying to find my way, so to speak. But Sean kept coming, and we stopped coming. <laughs> but he kept coming, and he was, you know, he was, I mean, like, even today, Sean is here, at, like, at 7 o'clock in the morning on Sundays. Nobody's here, but Sean's sitting outside on the bench, just waiting for the church doors to open. I'm like, I don't know if I can be that committed. <laughs> at least not yet, right? But anyways, um, so then uh, we came back again in 2006, and, you know, and then there's Donna here, who I met when I was working at Walden Woods, and she was telling me about Calvary, and I said, oh, you know, that's nice, and, you know, and she, when I was having those bad mornings and everything, Donna would pray with me, and, you know, because I wanted it, you know, and see, I, I, I inherited that gift of knowing who our Lord and Savior is from my grandmother. That's a beautiful thing right there, because not all people know about this great gift of hope. Not all people know. So then in 2013, we as a family, my husband Moses and my son Sean, we took our um, profession of faith here and Sean got baptized. And I was on fire. I mean, like, when I say on fire, I mean like on fire for the Lord. <laughs> I mean, like, I was good. I was grounded. I was... Mama knows that's one of my prayer warriors right there. And I was grounded. I, I, was, I, was, I was in a realm of peace. And I wrote a piece about the priceless peace. And, um, and there's nothing greater than that, that feeling of peace. And then I was asked, well, would you like to do Sunday school? And I'm like, seriously, you guys want me to? No, I'm not ready for that one yet either, you know. And then uh, the youth pastor comes up to me, and I'm, you know, for like a week, I'm like, are they out of their mind at Calvary? What? I mean, like, me? Like, I'm going to corrupt those kids or something, you know. <laughs> and then... Uh, the youth pastor, pastor, he comes up and he's like, so what do you about think about Sunday school? I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem. What do you do? Hey, I'm ready to do it. And I'm like, did I just say that? <laughs> you know, but it just came out. It just naturally just came out. And I'm like, okay, well, put Sunday school. Some of my students are here. But um, it was, life was good. Things were changing. And um, within myself, um, and I always had this feeling of, you know, being close to God. Um, even though with all the things I've been through in my life and everything else, 
I, I always knew to call on him, to pray to him. But I really wasn't as grounded as I am today. And with all of that being said, being on fire, having profession of faith, faith, doing Sunday school and all those things, service, that's a big passion of mine, serving, giving back what has been so freely given to me, Mr. Coffee. Yeah. Um, the Wednesday night dinners um, and just being obedient, you know, you need me, I'm there, you call me, I'm there, you know, Keisha, Taya, you know, I, oh, I needed to hear that today, thank you. And then I got hurt at work and I hurt my shoulder. And then I said, you know, Lord, you know, like, how am I supposed to do all this serving that I love to do? And you're hurting my shoulders hurt. I can't lift up a picture. I can't do this. I can't do that and everything else, you know. But I said, don't, you know, stop thinking about your shoulder, you know. And you can still go and attend and everything else. And then what happened? Two days later... We leave church, we go to a supermarket, and I wanted to go do a price check because I thought the girl was wrong about the price on the shrimp. And so I said, I'll be right back. And I run around the corner and boom, I fell on my left side. So I'm like, okay, the right side's messed up, the left side's messed up. Okay, what do you want me to get out of this? What are you trying to tell me? And I'm thinking that my life is over, <laughs> you know, but it really wasn't. And I knew from past experiences, one thing that my Aunt Mary told me, yeah, she just looked like, what did I tell you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I call it like I see it. Mm -hmm. um, she gave me this Bible. He me this Bible. And she told me, she said, Cindy, look, I know that you're, you know, you're feeling good and you're on fire and everything. She said, but, you know, be careful because, you know, the devil is always out there trying to come and, you know, attack you from all different directions and everything else. And I'm like, I don't really need to hear that because I have a relationship with him that is unbreakable. Nothing can come between this. And she said, well, I'm just saying, just be careful. Well, I understand what she meant today. Because with the injuries that I had, and I could not serve at the Wednesday night dinners, I was out of work, and... You know, it was frustrating. But then, you know, when you let down your guard and you, you know, that's the, that's the time. That is the time when the devil will try to come and pick at your pockets. You know, and someone once told me, you know, the devil doesn't like to pick any empty pockets. So when your pockets are full and you're on fire and you got everything going on, one little slip up. He wants to come in here and attack and take your happiness and your joy and all that good stuff. So anyways, I'm fighting to stay still, to stay focused, to be patient, trying to figure out what his will is. I'm trying to stay grounded in my reading, my worship, my fellowship, everything. And it worked. It was good. And I was back on fire again. And it was good to see Mr. Coffee again. And I was happy to see everybody at the Wednesday night dinners. I was happy to be around Mama and Judy and everybody else in the Wednesday night meetings, the prayer meetings and everything else. I was happy to walk through here and say, hey, everybody, how y'all doing? You know, everybody... You know, they may not see me, but they can hear me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and 
And uh, then, just this past year, just went by, I got hurt again at work. But this time, there was something else. Something else was going on also. And if you can imagine being on a beach or at Lake Michigan, and you ever see how the waves start, how a wave starts, like the water is calm, and then there's a little ripple that happens in the water, and then it gets bigger and bigger, and then there's the wave. And like, you know, it talked about in the text, you know, the waves coming up, you know, the disciples are in the boat and everything, and those waves are coming up, and they came out of nowhere. So, now the second injury comes. And I have tendonitis and one of my rotator cuffs. And then I had something going on in the heel of my left foot. And I'm saying to myself, okay, what is going on? And I was out of work again. And not only with the second injury, I also have found out that I had got, gotten a diagnosis of having rheumatoid arthritis. And I, now I really thought that my life was really over then. And I was really, really upset with God. Because I found out on a Friday at 5.30 in the afternoon, not by my doctor, but by the nurse, and I did not really know what rheumatoid arthritis was. I heard the commercials. You see the commercials on TV? And all the side effects that come along with it. I mean, that's enough to scare you right there. It's like, why take the medicine, you know? And next thing I know, um, I'm sitting up, I'm doing my homework, I'm trying to educate myself, and I had to tell myself to stop because I did not like what I was seeing, I didn't like the pictures, and I'm thinking, okay, next time I'm gonna be in a wheelchair in about a week, you know, and, but before I got to having all these images, I asked the, the, the lady, the nurse, I said, well, she says, well, you, well how long will I have this, this RA thing or whatever? She's like, well, for the rest of your life. I'm like, really? Like, seriously? And I'm like, well, how long do I have to take this medication? The rest of your life. I'm like, wait a minute, like, stop. You can't drop a bomb like that and not, like, expect me not to have any questions or anything. And because I'm thinking it's just an infection and it'll be over in 10 days, you know? But the rest of my life, man. But remember how those waves start. They're all calm. And then they start to pick up. And they get bigger. And for me, I see a tsunami wave coming. Because then I found out that my cousin was more like a niece to me. She is 21. And at the same time that I got this diagnosis, she was going through something. She was sick. And it's, they said, well, first it was a cold, and then it was pneumonia. And they sent her home. She went back and, and everything else. And I remember me and Moses, we went up to the hospital to go and see her. And I looked at her, and I, I, I tried my best to 
put aside everything that I was going through. And I was trying to cheer her up to make her smile. Because Cousin Cindy is the crazy one that's always doing weird <laughs> stuff. And, you know, and you guys know this. You know, make you try to make you smile in Sunday school class and everything. Right, Hope? Yeah. <laughs> but I couldn't make her smile. And I did not I I really I really thought that that it would be over and she would come home and and everything would be back to normal because she was a healthy young girl. And she didn't. She didn't come home. And in five months, her life ended. So now I'm really, really, I'm really mad. I'm really upset with the Lord. But everything inside me tells me that he does everything. He has a reason for everything that he does. Everything that I know, when he says, lean not on my own understanding because he is God. It is not my place to try to figure him out why he's doing this, why he's doing that. Stop it, Cynthia. Be still. But I couldn't. It was so difficult. And I started to rebel against him. I'm not going to pray then. And I'm not going to do this. And I'm not going to be obedient. And I'm, no, I'm not going over there to check on her because I don't feel like it. Can you do this for me? You know? And then stop it. Be still. Everything that has been taught to me, that I have learned along the way since Mary gave me this Bible and I started picking it up and I started reading His truth, everything that I know that He tells me that I should do, it's like He was saying to His disciples, you know, where's your faith? Quiet. Be still. And then, a week later, a good friend of mine, she passed away. And all of us, in the month of November, all three of us got life-changing, devastating news. And she passed away a week later, as I said. And she was left in her apartment for three days before anyone found her. Mind you, she was a double amputee. So she had like a half a body. And she walked on her hands. That's how she got around. And she was amazing. It was amazing to watch her live independently, you know. I mean, she could be down here and then be up on the counter and getting stuff out of her counter and then jumping back off and, you know, doing this. And, and, and I'm, I'm sitting there watching her, and I'm like, do you need me to do anything? You know, she's like, no, I got this. Why do you keep asking me that? Why don't you just sit down and chill out? And I'm like, okay. And just... I was devastated by that. So trying to be patient, trying to be still, 
once I found out that she had passed away. And then the month of May, it almost felt like every other day I was getting a text from someone saying that someone else had passed away, somebody else had died. That was my age that I grew up with, that I was close to, and I couldn't, I, I just couldn't deal with anything else. I couldn't be still. I, I couldn't stay grounded in his word. I couldn't, the fellowshipping, the, you know, everything that went along with it. You know, I wasn't here for prayer meeting. I couldn't be here to serve at Wednesday night dinners. And it was like things were just falling apart. Like what you told me, Mary. When you said, be careful. Because he has his way of coming in and robbing and stealing your joy. And now I'm going to go back about the ways. Back to verse 35. And he said, this is when Jesus is calming the storm. And then he says, the day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious wall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was simply swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? And I could see myself saying that. I hear myself saying that. Don't you care if I can't serve? Don't you care if I can't? You know, I, I can't, I want to have my own business. How can I do that if I can't do this? Don't you care? Don't you care that she was only 21? Don't you care? But he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the waves, He quiet, be still. And then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And then he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? So it's like he's saying to me, Cynthia, why are you so afraid? You have no faith. You say you trust in me. You say you believe in me. You believe in my promises. You believe in my work. You tell those Sunday school students, don't go dumpster diving. Stop kicking cans, you know? So if I'm telling these young girls these things, I've got to be telling myself this. I've got to be living it. I don't want to be a person that just reads the Bible. I want to live it too. I want to live it too. So, I was feeling the waves, the tsunami waves, the anxiety, the uncertainty, doubt, losing the ability day after day of keeping and maintaining my focus. Because I believe that even in this thing called Christianity, it is a way of life. It is a way of life. And you do have to maintain some things. There is some work that you have to do in order to maintain your focus on Him, to be still enough to hear Him, to see Him, to talk to Him, to stay grounded within him to stay rooted there's work that you have to do that's just the way it is this is an overtime thing 
can't be a part-time thing. Because if you're just doing it part-time, then I guess you will be one of those seeds that just fall off to the side. Let the sun scorch you. Keep running around like a chicken with his head cut off, wondering, how am I going to get through this? Well, I guess I do it by myself. Well, that doesn't work. Yeah. So, when I looked up the meaning of be still on my phone, my, you know those things called smartphones, I actually looked up the meaning of be still. <coughs> And it said, shut up. <laughs> Seriously. It said, shut up. <laughs> and, and I, just like what you, the way you guys responded, that's the way I responded, but louder. <laughs> and and I, I mean, like, I, I said, I don't believe this. And the first thing that I pictured in my head, they're in his boat. Jesus is on the side. He's trying to sleep. He's on his little cushion and everything. The waves are coming up and stuff, and they they all getting twisted up inside. Like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? <laughs> and I can imagine them saying, shut up. <laughs> Just shut up and be still. I got this. I got all of this under control. <laughs> so... Even though, you know, things may seem entangled, you have no roots, and there's a reason for everything. There's a reason for everything that he does. We have to trust in it. We have to believe in it. We have to have that sincerity within our hearts. Because without that, none of this stuff makes any sense anyway. And it starts with the renewing of your mind. And some people may say, well, you know, a lot of people have their own interpretations of this way or that way or whatever. But I do believe that if your mind is not in a certain frame of thinking, that it's virtually impossible to believe any of this that he says to believe in his truth and his word, to believe that prayer is possible, that prayer is powerful. So, I mean, if you don't think that it is, then why would you even do it? Why did, you know? So I believe that it all starts up here. That, that's just my own interpretation. And if it don't apply, let it fly, please, okay? Don't send me any bad texts. Um, but anyways, um, I still, I can ask myself, you know, what type of seed am I? And then, what type of seed am I living? What kind of seeds am I living? <laughs> Marriage? job, children, disease, death, family. What kinds of seeds are these categories? Because when you read the text, you can actually apply everyday life situations with a lot of those different types of seeds. So what seed are you? What seed are you living today? And I guess the important question is, how do we stay rooted in Jesus? How do we stay rooted in Him? And then 38, verse 38 to 41, He says, Quiet, be still. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? That is powerful right there to me. So when you think that all the stuff that you're going through, whatever it is, whether it's your job, whether it's, you know, your wife, your girlfriend, <laughs> finances, 
whatever mm -hmm. the case may be. What kind of seed are you, or are you going to stay rooted within the Lord? That's the question you have to ask yourself. That's the question I had to ask myself. And then when uh, when the tsunami started to calm down, you know, <laughs> I love you, Lord. He used my son Deontay right here. This is my youngest son. And he came up to me and my husband and he said, hey, you guys want to go to Cedar Point? And we were like, mm. I was like, yeah. You know, like, like the Holy Spirit like just took over. Yeah, I'll go. I'm like, no, I want to go. But it was like, yeah, I want to go, but no, I want to go. And then my husband was like, you know, I want to save that money for something else. You know, I'm like, well, I think we would have a good time. Well, let's just do this, you know. And my sister-in-law and my future brother-in-law here, you know, they were wanting to plan this trip to go to Florida. And I wanted to do that too. And I really wanted to go to Florida. And I really wasn't thinking about Cedar Point. But see, remember who's in control. So... He used you to speak to me, to get to me, with just saying, let's go to Cedar Point. So we get to Cedar Point, and you get there, you see all these big old roller coasters and everything, you know? And I got up there, and I'm walking, and I'm like, I'm not getting on that. I'm not getting on that. Definitely not that. No, no, no. No. And I had this sour attitude, mind you, because, you know, like, things wasn't going right, you know. When things aren't going right for you, you know, you, you kind of push that off on other people, too. You know, it's like, yeah, what's wrong with her? You know, why is she acting all weird? Because I'm sour. I'm not rooted. I'm off to the side. The sun's scorching me. You know, I can't breathe. I don't. I need some water. And he always said we don't have to thirst no more, right? We come and drink some of this water. But anyways, Moses says to me, my husband. He says, "Come on, baby, let's get on this ride." And I'm like, "Okay." But I'm like, "Where did that just come from?" You know. And so I'm like, "All right, let's go." We get on the raptor. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And I can hear him talking to me, and I can hear all the people around me. But all I'm saying to myself is, like, I hear something say, like, face your fears. Face your fears. So as I'm walking, and then we had a, we got those bands where you get in line, you know, in front of everybody else and everything. So it didn't even give me time to think about what I was doing, you know. It was like, next thing I knew, we were up there, and they're like, go ahead, get on, ma'am. You know, and I'm like, okay, face your fears, face your fears, face your fears. And I'm holding on for dear life. <laughs> and I'm just sitting up there, I'm like, face your fears, face your fears, face your fears, face your fears. And it was over. <laughs> and when I get off, I look at Moses, I'm like, I did it. I did it, Moses, I did it, I did it. And he's like, yeah, baby, you did it. And I'm like, okay, all right, all right. Okay, let's go get on the next one, <laughs> okay? And the next one, you know, we got on that new one, the Rob Raven, the newest one for Cedar Point, that has broken 12 world records. And it, the drop is like 213 feet. Judy's sitting here like, oh my goodness, she is crazy. <laughs> there's fear and then there's crazy, Cynthia. I'll, Judy will tell me afterwards, you know. But I said, come on, let's go get on that one. And I'm like, okay. And I said, face your fears, face your fears, face your fears. 
Because I'm thinking that's what's working, right? Just saying that, you know? So I'm like, face your fears, face your fears, face your fears. And then as we're on a right, and it's going up, 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 up. And then the right actually stops at the top. And it hangs there. It just hangs there for a few seconds for enough anticipation to just go through your whole entire body and you're like, what am I doing, you know? But then by the time you say, what am, you know, it drops. And, but something, and I know what the something was, it was the Holy Spirit saying to me, no, open your eyes and face your fears. So, I opened my eyes. And we're going out 213 feet. And I'm looking at this, and I'm seeing it all open up. And then it comes down, and it goes around, and as it swings around, I felt a freedom that I hadn't felt since I was baptized. I kid you not. I felt like I was flying with Jesus. I kid you not. It was so much fun. And we took pictures of every coaster we got off of. <laughs> and like the first one on a rap I'm like, <laughs> yeah. and then all the other ones, I'm like, Yay, cheese! Yeah. And, and if I had the pictures to show, you could see the before and after, and it's like, it's just beautiful smiles afterwards. And I'm sitting here, and I get off the ride, and I'm laughing. And Moses is looking at me like, what are you laughing at? What's so funny? And I'm like, remember when I got baptized? And I came out of the water, and I was laughing. After I got baptized, I was laughing. And I literally could not stop smiling for like two days. Seriously. I was just going around. I was so happy. <laughs> just smiling. And I hadn't felt that feeling until I got off that roller coaster. And from that moment on, I knew that I was free. Everything that was holding me down, that I felt locked in, the anxiety, the fear, the unknown, it was gone. It was literally gone. It was, Anya. <laughs> they love when I put them on a spot like that. <laughs> <laughs> Good comeback. You're learning. You're learning. <laughs> but I think of it like this. Jesus always gives us an invitation to be still. He always gives us an invitation. And the results of writing and facing my fears and not even riding a roller coaster since 1980. That was the last time that I rode a roller coaster was in 1980. And the feeling of that priceless peace of a patient heart, the awakening, the beauty of feeling his love wrapped around me, feeling of flying with Jesus, oh my goodness. It is beautiful. Mm. It led me to a place of being still. So, so what? I have this thing called RA. But I have Jesus. I've suffered with the loss of family, friends, but I have Jesus. So I don't have the position or the hours that I want at work, but I have Jesus. I have Jesus, and he is able. 
He tells me to keep my focus on Him. He tells me to cast my burdens on Him. He tells me to trust and believe in Him. He tells me not to trust in mortal man and the ways of worldly things. He tells me, come, talk to him first. He tells me to call his name. He tells me not to lean on my own understanding because he is God. He is in control, not me. He tells me to let the Holy Spirit take over. He tells me to worship Him. He tells me to stay rooted in His Word, not mine. He reminds me time and time again, He is in control and not me. He tells me He is able, He is able to rule all those seeds, every last one of them. He can move them all. Any seed that if you are going through in your life, He can move them all. He can move the mountains. He can move a seed. It's simple, but not easy. He puts them back where they should be, according to His will and in His time. Right, Christy? In his time, not mine. So this is the invitation also. He solely, freely gives to us to be patient, to be still and focused on him. So now, I'll answer the question that I was asked by my cousin in that mass text. And she said, what seed are you, Cindy? And I finally answered, and I said, all of them. All of them. temptation is to run away and maybe think about this later, but we're just going to take a moment to ask ourselves that question um, in a silent prayer. So Jesus, you give us your word, and you give us your word through people. And I pray that we open our hearts just a moment, and I'll just model that prayer. Father, I open my heart. I pray that you'd speak to any fear Speak to any self-centered desires. Speak to any confusion. Speak to any stuff that's been growing up in my life that I just really enjoy, but ultimately doesn't bear much fruit. Maybe it just leaves. <coughs> Father, you dwell in all places, and I invite you into my heart to speak to me. But some of us are in situations that we have no idea how to resolve. Like we have no idea. But Father, just like Cynthia shared, I pray that you would bring us through circumstances, conversations, events, difficult times, fun times, celebration times, and times of just sitting back and reflecting. That you give us your insight, that you give us your epiphanies, to use a fancy word your experiences that speak deeply into our hearts and pray that you take us on a journey just like you've taken Cynthia on a journey of, of difficulty perhaps but ultimately uh, growth and inviting you into our lives. We thank you that you don't judge people like people judge people. That you know our heart and you accept us forgiven as we are. Not so you can leave us as we are but so you can take us into a new place of freedom, of opportunity, 
of obedience. Lord, we thank you that um, we have access to you. We thank you that you come to us long before we came to you. Lord, I pray that you be with us this evening as we talk here, as we talk elsewhere, and as we get ready for whatever may come tomorrow. In Jesus' name, we lift all these things up to you. Amen. 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 So honestly, we didn't want to uh, do a lot after Cynthia talked because we want you just to have, be able to reflect on this and to say hi to her. I don't know if you still have to go to work tonight either, but, um, but we wanted to do this. So I'm just going to invite you to stand, and I'm going to give a blessing that's really old. Some of us watch movies, and there's things from movies that are like thousands of years old. And this is one of those sayings that God gave to people three to 4,000 years ago. It's an, ancient, uh, it's an ancient blessing. And it goes like this. May the Lord bless you. And may the Lord keep you. May the Lord be gracious to you and turn his face towards you. May the Lord grant you peace and make his face to shine upon you. Go in that peace and that experience. Amen. 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 I said, yeah, um, Judy, I'll let me have it. After all this. 213 feet, Cynthia, I'll be crazy. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you.